Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. If you're not new, you remember that last week we had ice cream, and that was fun. We're fun here. So if you don't know, there's a cafe upstairs. The whole second floor of this building is a cafe. It's really cool. There are game areas and all kinds of neat things. It's not really churchy up there. We serve really good coffee. If you had a cup of coffee when you came in, it was good. It's good coffee. Someone came up to me once and they said, this is nothing like church coffee. So apparently there's such a thing as church coffee and it's not good. The coffee here is very good. So we serve that in that cafe. Check it out. You can actually purchase an espresso. Be careful. You'll be awake for about three days approximately if you have one of those. They're very, very strong. And on Sundays we serve food and it's much more then a potluck. It's good food. We serve good food up there. So after the service, let's fellowship, break some bread together. Now, on the topic of the ice cream, we had some times of confession about the ice cream. A lot of people like it, maybe a little too much. But I heard a story about a couple. They liked ice cream. There was an issue. They were getting older, and their memories were not as good anymore. So they went to the doctor, See what they could do about it. Maybe get some ginkgo biloba. No, that's over the counter. If you know what that is, you're a nerd. But we're a doctor or something like that. So they asked the doctor, what do we do? We're forgetting stuff left and right. Well, you know, I don't think it's time for the medication just yet. Write things down. If you think you might forget, write it down so you don't forget it. Okay, there's your prescription. Go back home. So they went back home, and the wife asked for ice cream. I'd like some ice cream. Husband's not picking it up, doesn't say anything. She's like, you know, I'd really like some ice cream. Do you want me to get you ice cream? Right? Finally picks it up. Fine, I'll get it for you. What do you want? What flavor? Vanilla, she says. How many scoops? How much do you want? Two scoops. Do you think you might want to write this down like the doctor said? No, I got it. How hard can it be? Well, I'm going to add some extra items here. All right. But I got it. Fine. I'll prove it to you. Vanilla, two scoops, okay. Want whipped cream on it, whipped cream on there. You sure you don't want to write this down because there's going to be more things. No, I got it. I'll prove it to you. Two scoops of vanilla ice cream, whipped cream. Keep going. Huh? We're not there yet. <laughs> Hot, you guys, this is making you hungry, isn't it? She's bringing out that, that, that coveting for the ice cream. That's not the point of this anyway. So the whipped cream, then we're going to put some sprinkles on there. Jimmy's, if you're from Boston, we're not going to get into that today. It's weird. They're sprinkles. <laughs> they're sprinkles. They're multicolored. Someone's from Boston. <laughs> they're multicolored. You sure you don't want to write this down? She's going on and on. No, I got it. All right. Cherry on top. There we go. We're going to put the cherry on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to put the cherry on there. Do you got it? Yes, I got it, he says. It's going to be two scoops, vanilla, whipped cream, hot fudge, sprinkles, not Jimmy's, multicolored, all right, and we're going to get the cherry on top. I got it. Fine. So he goes in the kitchen to get it. Five minutes goes by. Ten minutes goes by. He's like, what's going on? Maybe he's heating up the fudge, doing it right. I don't know. But now 20 minutes a half hour. It was a little too long on this. So just as she was about to get up and go and check on him, he comes out with a plate. Ice cream doesn't go on a plate. <laughs> with two eggs, sunny side up, two pieces of bacon, two pancakes with hot fudge, <laughs> whipped cream, sprinkles, and a cherry on top. She looks at the plate, looks at him, and says, where's my toast? <laughs> Took a long time to get to that punch. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to talk about remembering things today. So we find ourselves in the rest of the story. This is a very long series because there's a lot to the Bible. People try to oversimplify this. It's just not simple. It takes a long time to get through it. There's a lot in there that people just don't talk about, and that's kind of what 
we're looking at throughout this series, and not without application. So we're going to talk about remembering some things. We're talking about King Hezekiah. So these are the kings of Judah. We saw the kings of Israel. So you think, if you don't know the Bible very well, like King David's times. So David, you might know about Solomon. You may know about Rehoboam, but this is where this whole split in the kingdom happens. So Rehoboam's not as smart as his dad. The split kingdom. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. So Israel just fell recently, a couple weeks ago, in this church series. They fall to the Assyrians. Now Judah's still around. You're going to see good king, bad king, good king, bad king. So here you get a kind of good king. We saw Hezekiah. We saw that the point was, right, that works were a product of our faith. He had faith, but that faith produces works within us. We looked at the book of James. It says that there. God's words, not mine. So that was the point. Now we're going to look at the other half of Hezekiah. We're going to see what happens here. So we saw that he did a lot. Right? So he constructed the walls, the outer wall, two walls, all this stuff for the defenses and everything. Right? The temple, he prays, and God comes through in a really big way. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died. They're camped out to try to attack Jerusalem. God does that for them. So this is the backdrop now we have to be thinking about. We talked about books of the Bible going in parallel. Today we're in 2 Kings 20, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 38 and 39. 2 Chronicles doesn't devote very much to the story, but it's going to give us some important details. So we're going to look at that. We're going to be in 2 Kings. Isaiah gives us a little more. I'll bounce to that when it's time. So the Lord rescues everybody, rescues Jerusalem from the Assyrians. This is the backdrop, and now King Hezekiah becomes famous. He's made a name for himself somehow, and he's getting all these gifts. They're sending him presents and all these different gifts. So if we pick up right there on that thought, 2 Kings 21, about that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill, and the prophet Isaiah, here's where he comes in, son of Amoz, went to visit him. He gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. Not good news. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. So the picture you're going to get here, if you keep reading, is that Isaiah leaves. He gives this message, just drops that on him, boom, and then walks out. And it kind of says before he gets through the yard, before he leaves the property, the Lord tells him, hey, you know what? Go back and give this a new one to Hezekiah. Tell him this. It says, I've heard your prayer. So three days from now, you're going to be healed. And I'm going to add 15 years to your life. Well, <clears throat> so Isaiah... His little doing here, makes an he orders his servants to make an ointment and cover the boil. Apparently, this was the sickness, the boil, and is going to heal him up. So they do that. Then Hezekiah says to Isaiah, meanwhile, this is happening in the meantime. This kind of makes the Bible confusing. It jumps around a little bit. Says, what sign will the Lord give me to prove to me that this is going to happen? So it's obviously before it happens. Isaiah says, he gives him a little choice. Well, here's what's going to happen. Do you want the sundial to move forward 10 steps or backward 10 steps? And it's the sundial of Ahaz. And if you've been paying attention, that's his dad. Well, he's like, moving forward is easy because it always goes forward. Well, like a clock. Make it go backwards. So sure enough, that happens. The shadow on the sundial moves back 10 steps. So it'll be like sitting there and watching your clock just go whoop all by itself. But there are no electronics, which means the sun has to literally move in the sky backwards, like let's just say 10 hours. Kind of crazy. It happens, he's healed. Now, there's something that's not in 2 Kings or 2 Chronicles. It's a poem or like a prayer that Hezekiah devotes. So that is only in Isaiah. And let me read it to you. Isaiah, not the whole thing. 38.9, when Hezekiah was well again, he wrote this poem. I said, in the prime of my life, must I now enter the place of the dead? Am I to be robbed of the rest of my years? Delirious, I chattered like a swallow or a crane, and then I moaned like a mourning dove. My eyes grew tired of looking at heaven for help. I'm in trouble, Lord, help me. What could I say? For he himself sent the sickness. Now I will walk humbly throughout my years because of this anguish I have felt. 
Lord, your discipline is good, for it leads to life and health. You restore my health and allow me to live. Yes, this anguish was good for me, for you have rescued me from death and forgiven all my sins. For the dead cannot praise you. Then I cannot raise their voices in praise. Those who go down to the grave can no longer hope in your faithfulness. Only the living can praise you as I do today. Each generation tells of your faithfulness to the next. Think of it. The Lord is ready to heal me. I will sing his praises with instruments every day of my life in the temple of the Lord. Prayer, kind of significant if you read the Psalms a lot, should remind you of Psalm 6, I think verse 5, and Psalm 30. There's this kind of like petition to the Lord quite often when people are in desperation or deeply praising. Lord, the dead can't praise you. If you let me die, how will I be able to worship you? So that shows up in the Psalms. If we keep reading, 2 Kings 2012. Soon after this, Merodach Baladin, son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah his best wishes and a gift, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been very sick. Hezekiah received the Babylonian envoys and showed them everything in his treasure houses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the aromatic oils. He also took them to see his armory and showed them everything in his royal treasuries. There was nothing in his palace or kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. So Isaiah shows up. What did those people want? Where were they from? They came from the distant land of Babylon. What did they see in your palace? Isaiah says, they saw everything, Ezekiah replied. I showed them everything I own, he says. All my royal treasuries. 2 Kings 20.16 Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord. The time is coming when everything in your palace, all the treasuries stored up by your ancestors until now, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your very own sons will be taken away into exile. They will become eunuchs who will serve in the palace of Babylon's king. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, this message you have given me from the Lord is good. For he was thinking, at least there will be peace and security during my lifetime. Kind of selfish. If we conclude, 2 Kings 20.20, the rest of the events in Hezekiah's reign, including the extent of his power and how he built a pool and dug a tunnel to bring water into the city recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. Hezekiah died, and his son Manasseh became the next king. We'll look at Manasseh next week. So we see this pattern here whether it be this week or last week, of Hezekiah doing something and then the Lord coming through in a really big way. But here's the thing. Instead of boasting in the Lord, he boasts in himself. So let's think about it. What's the context? What's going on here? Babylonians show up. First thing, pretty impressive. (laughs) Did you see how God killed 185,000 troops and I didn't have to lift a finger? How about that? Why aren't we talking about that? That was pretty amazing, because if they conquered me, they would have taken all the stuff I just showed you. You should be pointing to that. Hey, did you notice? Like, you might have been outside yesterday, and we lost 10 hours. (laughs) All right? Did you see the sun go in the sky? We lost 10. Not talking about that at all. That's not a thing. Hey, I was going to die, but the Lord healed me in exactly three days. That's pretty amazing. No, the Babylonians show up, and he says, look what I did. (laughs) Amazing. Look what I did. So here's the thing. We can add a fourth book if we want to make it a little more confusing. (laughs) That runs a little bit in parallel-ish. If you read the Psalms a lot, you might have noticed. You get to 25, and he says, these are the Proverbs that Hezekiah's advisors collected. Maybe not written by him, but his advisors gather him up. 25, 26, 27, 28, and probably 29. So you get to Augur, chapter 30. Maybe he didn't read them because Proverbs 27 says this, Don't brag about tomorrow since you don't know what the day will bring. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Important. We're going to do a little bit of review today. That's important. Good teaching is fairly repetitive. If you read the Bible a lot, you know it's very (laughs) repetitive. As we can see, the account three times today. But it takes us a while to get stuff, doesn't it, if we're being honest? 
they're like sale signs. I worked in sales for a long time, and it's like, it takes like, what, 10 times for someone to realize something. They have to see it a lot of times. So we'll do a little review today. Here's the thing. Remember, I talked about 1 Corinthians in the first situation, this pastor worship that they're doing, divisions in the church. Bad. Chapters 1 through Paul, he gets kind of mad, says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you, although he admits he does, then says, I'm going to beat you with a stick. That's basically how it goes, 1 through 4. But in the midst of that, who is Apollos? He's an eloquent speaker. Who is Apollos? Right? Who is Peter, the lead apostle? Who's Paul? Me. Like, who's Paul? Right? Who are we? I just planted. Apollos just watered. But God causes the growth. So, yes, we do something. We're vehicles. But God causes the growth. It's the important thing to remember. So, we talked about our faith and our works. But here the lesson is, don't get stuck on the works thing, people. Right? you you got to be doing something. But, but God. That's the problem here. God causes the growth, but how quickly we forget. How quickly we forget. So I kind of think of this Mark 8. It's a situation that happens. A lot of people don't know there are 5,000 fed, and then there are 4,000 fed. So first time, they only have five loaves, two fish. They feed everybody, all 5,000 people. There's maybe more because women and children, a lot of people there. Big miracle, 12 baskets of leftovers. Right, so, but if we get to Mark 8, it says 4,000 people. Seven loaves, that's all they got, and maybe a few small fish. And they have leftovers, seven baskets. Big miracle happens. They feed a lot of people. Jesus, he just blesses it, and then it just keeps coming. Now, the disciples, God working hand in hand with us, you feed them, right? So they're distributing it. So Jesus is multiplying it. He's causing the growth. But they're like, you know, feeding the people. Do some service here. They get in the boat, going to leave, and disciples go, oh, we forgot to take bread. Really? That's not the only thing you forgot. You forgot what Jesus did. Think about it. That's very prideful. The Lord just fed thousands of people. You're not still amazed by this? This is amazing. And then all you can think about is what your part in it was, right? But like, we distributed it. Yeah, we're really good at that. So, oh, we forgot to do what we're really good at. <laughs> what? So Jesus says something important. A lot of people just pass by. I'm going to talk about a little Greek today. It's okay. I'm going to try my best to pronounce it. I'm good at reading, not saying. But anyway, he says, remember. Don't you remember? That's how he addresses them. And he gives them like a math quiz. Like the first time, how many baskets of leftovers? You know, remember the five loaves? How many baskets of leftovers? Twelve. You know. The second time, seven loaves? How many leftovers? Seven. You know, they answer the questions instead of just going, you know, and being shamed. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? How quickly we forget. Why? Pride. Pride. Pride is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one, one's own achievements, right? One's own achievements. The achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, we'll talk about that, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired, like Hezekiah's. We forget because we become wrapped up in ourselves. If we go to the parallel account in 2 Chronicles, we get some reasoning. 2 Chronicles 32, 24. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. He prayed to the Lord who healed him and gave him a miraculous sign. So this is the one sentence or one line, two sentences, one line, one verse version of that whole thing we went through. But Hezekiah did not respond appropriately to the kindness shown him. He became proud. So the Lord's anger came against him and against Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself and repented of his... Pride, that's the problem, as did the people of Jerusalem. So the Lord's anger did not fall on them during Hezekiah's lifetime, right? And he's like, Phew, at least it won't fall on me. Good luck, sons. Now, this will be like a digression, but we're going to review just a little bit because it's important and this is going to be hard. When we talk about pride, that's difficult. And I know for most of you watching news, something's coming to mind. But here's the thing. 
And if you know the Bible really well, there's a lot of leveling the playing field when we get prideful. So, how ironic. That's bad pride. <laughs> but you're prideful. Paul levels the playing field a lot. Romans 1, 2, 3. Yes, the Gentiles sin, but you Jews... Teach yourself. You've sinned too. Three, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he sets up what he's going to say. So it's something we have to think about. So let's do a little review. We've talked about bad teachings in Christianity. And we've noticed there are a lot of them. And I always kind of liken it because I'm a foodie. I like my restaurants. It's kind of like five-star restaurants. Maybe not in Naples, but everywhere else in the world, <laughs> there are more like fast food places than there are five-star restaurants. So there's more common like commercial stuff. It's really not good for you if we're being honest. Sometimes they have ice cream. It's good, but there's more of it. So same thing. It's no different in Christianity in America, and I'm not saying it's great anywhere else, but here we like to commercialize stuff. And so we need to make it cheap and easy, right? We want it quick, cheap, easy, give it to me fast. And so it's been commercialized. So the bigger churches, the, it seems that the more you do that well, the bigger you're going to get. But like a nice little French restaurant or something like that, you're going to get like a really good meal there. It's going to be better, but it's small. And then someone will come in, an American, typical American, and they'll sit down and be like, I know how you can get more customers. <laughs> and they go, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, go away. Don't ruin my restaurant. So there's a lot of bad teachings out there. And I talked about one. And let's review this real quick so we can get to the next one. You might have heard it. You might have posted it. If you did, don't do it again. And the Bible says, fear not 365 times. Have you heard that? It says, fear not 365 times. It's not true. It's not even close. So there's a thing called reading your Bible, and then you would know this does not sound right. It does not sound right. Fear the Lord. Like, that's more prominent if you read the Word of God a lot. You get that. And it's not just in the Old Testament. Oh, Gene, you're going Old Testament. No. Philippians, New Testament book, one of the friendliest letters of the New Testament. Paul still says, chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation with fear. And versions say trembling. Now, the Greek word is terror. Terror. Our American translations are afraid of that. Terror that connotates trembling. You're so scared, you're like, ah, work out your salvation with fear and terror. That's the New Testament. So the Bible says, fear not. What is that? What are they talking about? So here's the thing. I get the concordance out. So Strong's Concordance gives all the words in the Bible. And you can count if you're crazy enough to, like me. So it bothered me, and I started counting. I got to about 84 times it says fear not. About 84. Even if I'm off by 16, we get to 100. That's not even close to 365, not even close. But words for fear, 533 times. Well, let's just round down in case I'm wrong by 33. 500 times, and most of those times, it says you should fear, especially the Lord. So, Pastor Gene, calm down. What's wrong with that? Well, think about it for a second. What's the next thing people say? Oh, but, you know, we're supposed to just be in awe of God, right? So we're trying to make him Santa Claus. So he's going to just, like, give us stuff. And there's no accountability. We don't have to worry. Fear of the Lord, that's going to stop a lot of your sin. That's what that does. But we want to get rid of that. Because it's not all have sinned. It's all are constantly sinning and falling short of the glory of God, right? We don't read it right. So here's another one. Pride. Pride. You ever hear the phrase, pride and joy? Sounds innocent. You might have even read it in the Bible. It's crept its way in there. 1 Thessalonians 2.20. You're my pride and joy in some versions. Doesn't say that. When you read it in the Greek, it says, you're my glory and joy. But in English, it doesn't make sense in our minds. So innocently, I think, the translators say, well, what would we say in English? Say pride and joy. But they weren't thinking. You've just created a contradiction. You've made pride a good thing. And it's never a good thing in the Bible. It's bad. Proverbs 17, 6. Right? So grandchildren are the crowning glory of the aged. Parents are the pride of their children. It's not what it says. We'll talk about that word in Greek later. But I think it's innocent. 
But if you keep reading, and you read more Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 5, the Lord detests, strong word, the proud, they, were sh they will surely be punished. Pride goes before destruction, and haughtiness, another word for pride, before a fall. Better to live humbly with the poor than to share plunder with the proud. Could it be more clear? The Bible translated correctly always says that pride is a bad thing. But we're proud of a lot of things, aren't we? Our identity. And that bothers some people. But here's the funny thing. We talked about this. If you've been here for a while, we've had these conversations. If you're new, everything is seen through this lens. And when you really do that, it's weird. Because you look at things through a worldly lens, which this tells you not to, it's very different. Twists it. All right? So it's like it gets all twisted up through that lens. So I'll give you the pastor lens. All right? When I'm looking at it through this, uh huh, pride's a bad thing. And so you get American Christians who maybe they're identifying more with their politics and they'll rant and rave. And yeah, I get it. You've got to have a whole month for pride. You're shoving this down my throat. Stop it. Now I'm watching, <laughs> watching the argument. That same person who complained about the pride, right? It says pride's a sin, and they'll say that, right? They'll say that. They'll turn right around and say, yeah, and I'm proud to be an American. That's interesting. Ah. Pride in the Bible is never a good thing. Never. Now, you're going to say, what about my national pride? And I'm going to answer, what do you worship? There should be nothing above the Lord, nothing above Jesus. I'm happy to be here. Disclaimer, ready? E e disclaimer, happy to be here. I do what the Bible says. I honor my authorities, very honoring, loving. We're all about our community here. Politics? Really? If I said honest politician, you're going to laugh. But those are the people <laughs> that are running the government. So we honor them, but that's not where my hope is. We talked about that last week. That is not, I'm not looking for the government for hope. <laughs> that's in the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of that kingdom. So let me explain to you what the Bible says about this for real, for real. Because if America was a Christian country, it would look totally different, totally different. It's not. So Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, let's turn the page. Philippians chapter 3. So Paul goes, you know what? It's no problem for me to warn you about this again like I have in the past. Beware of the dogs. They're false teachers. He calls them dogs. So later he'll say, their God is their belly. It's their appetite. They're dogs. Beware of these false teachers. They're no good. In fact, if anyone had a reason to brag, it would be me. I'm from the nation of Israel. I'm a citizen of Israel. So he names his citizenship. Right? <laughs> Circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a Hebrew if there ever was one. From the tribe of Benjamin. He's naming all his like credentials. Where he's from, a Pharisee if there ever was one. Really well-trained guy. Know the Bible really well. But guess what? It's all garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Garbage. And in the Greek there, I'll say it wrong, skivala. Right? So today you might say like rubbish, like it's rubbish. It's actually, in this context, in the biblical context, more akin to C-R-A-P. That's how the force with which Paul is saying that. I'm oppressed. Let's modernize it. You know, watch out for those false teachers, guys. It's, it's bad stuff, all right? But I could brag. You know, I went to seminary, whatever it is. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm this. I'm a proud American. But it's all C-R-A-P compared to knowing Jesus. It's exactly what Paul says except he doesn't call himself Pastor Gene. But anyway, read chapter 3. Read it. Read it for yourself. There's a reason I didn't put that up on the screen. Don't believe me. 
Don't believe anybody. Check your Bible. He's doing the right thing. Look for yourself, and you'll see. This is how Paul contrasts his pride in his nationality with knowing Jesus. That is superior. My citizenship to the kingdom of heaven is above all else. And when you do that, you see this world for what it is. It's ridiculous. It's all things a circus. I want Jesus to come back. And that's the narrative over and over and over in the Bible. It won't be perfect until Jesus comes back. That's it. And by the way, he does continue at the end of that chapter by reminding them. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's it. So we're going to nerd out just for a minute. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. Because I've heard people say this. So let's put the Greek on the screen. I've heard, we're not going to be here for long. Don't worry. Don't get nervous. So, so I've heard people say there's such a thing as good pride. No, there's just different words for that, right, in the English language. So when it says pride, it's just bad. So same thing, fear. Well, it's not really fear. It really means awe. No, there's a word called awe for that. And if it was a better translation, they would have just put the word awe there, right? So you hear people do that, right? Like the, 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 the like, I don't know. Anyway, those type of Christians, right? No, it never really means fear or terror. No, it's just really, it's just, it, it, is it a mistranslation? I don't know. But Greek is the same. They have different words for things. And so these are three words that sometimes get translated as pride. The middle one is the only one of the three that should pretty much always get translated as pride. It's bad. So the first one, kachima, I have my Greek teacher watching online right now, so I'm going to get a text later, so that'll be funny. That's to boast. That's the best word we have for it. But, but. It's an interesting kind of boast. And the concept, I spent like an hour on the phone with her trying to get this idea, but I think I got it. It's good, it can be good when you're boasting about someone else, like you're elevating them. Do you speak Greek? Yeah. Oh, you're, you're agreeing with me way too much. So anyway, <laughs> I was like, we got a Greek. I was going to bring you right up. Say it right. <laughs> Sorry. My reading is pretty good. My biblical Greek is pretty good, reading it pretty good, but my Pronunciation is absolutely horrible. So I spent a lot of time with my Greek teacher on the phone with this one. So you can elevate somebody else, right? My little kachima, like, you know, you're my boast. You're doing really, really well. So that can be good. Hiperifanos, bad. That is pride. No good, never any good. Alazunia, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Sometimes gets translated pride. We're going to understand it's a very ancient word. Only occurs, I think, two times in the New Testament. So arrogance, it's also bad. Again, the second one, pride. Never great. Why? Because it's when we make it about us. We make it about us. So if we boast in someone else, not bad, depending on how far we go with it. And so we see both in the Bible. So sometimes Paul will go on and on, like 2 Corinthians eleven twelve. the fool's boast in there. That's kafhuma. That's, he'll, he'll say that's bad. So it can be a bad thing if it's about you. That's the word being used there. All right, I'm done with the Greek. What? Not quite. So <laughs> even our affiliation with God can become prideful. Even our affiliation, we can become prideful about that. And we have to be careful with it. Anytime it's about us, this is not popular. It's not good. So, 1 John 2.16. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possession. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. They're not heavenly. They're worldly. Not good in the Bible. Pride is when we're more focused on the world than the Word. It's when we're more focused on ourselves than God. Whether it be God himself or more focused in our part in that affiliation. Whether it be like the disciples, right? See how good I passed out the bread that you multiplied miraculously? <laughs> but we do this kind of stuff. Pride causes us to forget. Pride is when we forget others who have helped us. Others who may quite frankly be better than us. We forget others in general and we focus on ourselves. <laughs> We forget where we've come from or the position we were in, like Hezekiah did. We forget about people who are currently in that position, and we even look down on them in an unwarranted way. Now, 
That word will bring up 1 John 2.16 in the original, the best translation. That word in 1 John 2.16 for pride, that's actually how most translations render it, but that's that alazunia. That's what that is. That's arrogance. That's what's really there. And so this is kind of my translation for it, the GSV, if you will. Uh, <laughs> for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the arrogance of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So most English translations, everything from the KJV, the King James Bible, to the NIV will say lust there for that word. In modern Greek, it could be like a desire or a wish, but it's lust because of the context in this book. You're lusting. You want it in a bad way. You're lusting after these things. Arrogance. Exaggerating or disposed to exaggerate one's own worth and importance, often in an overbearing manner. An offensive attitude of superiority. This feeling of superiority causes us to forget our place. We forget. We forget Jesus. We forget that Jesus is superior. We are going to close with the book of Hebrews today, and I want to just briefly explain the context. Really important. You understand contexts when you look at texts, not just singular verses. Hebrews. The whole point is that Jesus is superior. That's it. Over and over and over again. They're, they're Jewish Christians, right? So they were Jews first, like Jesus and the apostles. They become Christians, and they're like, ooh, like Thessalonica, their own people are persecuting them. So they're like, eh, I don't want to do this anymore. It hurts. So the author or preacher, we don't know who it is. Don't waste time speculating. <laughs> Just read the book. Concentrate on the point of the book of Hebrews and not who might have wrote it. And when you read it, you see Jesus is superior to everything. Jesus is superior to the prophets, to the angels. He's the superior son. He's superior to Moses, to Joshua, to Melchizedek, the priesthood. He's the mediator of a superior covenant, chapters 8 through 10. 11, so we live by faith, examples of faith. 12, disciplined lives. The Lord received discipline, so should we. And then we get to chapter 13. Now, last week, we saw that focusing, how, how do we do this? We fix our eyes on Jesus, solution to all of your problems. So that's where we left off last week, Hebrews 12. Let's turn the page. Important word. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, if I didn't say that. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some have done this, have entertained angels without even realizing it. Remember, mimniskome, if I'm saying that right. Remember, that word pops up a lot. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your bodies. This word is like an eternal memory, something you should be constantly aware of. Remember. Keep this here, right, so that you don't have a fat head, you have a flat head. Keep that in your memory always. Remember. So look at this. Remember where you were. Remember what was happening to you. Remember. Then Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders who taught you the Word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow their example of faith. Imitate them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Then it talks about doing good for others, that that is actually like our sacrifice. That's how we worship. So it's kind of like Romans 12. How do you worship? Not by singing lies. You worship by loving others. That's real worship. Obey your leaders. Imitate them. We should be in a constant state of remembrance and imitation of Jesus. Period. Fix your eyes on him. He who humbled himself to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Imitate that. And here we see, remember those in need. Remember and imitate your leaders. We must be in a state of humility, not thinking of ourselves, but in remembrance of Jesus. That is our proper alignment. Let me pray from you, for you from the end of Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, 
who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen.